The pandemic-driven shift to a work-from-home culture led to a huge wave of remote workers leaving big cities and unpacking in states like Georgia, Arizona, Florida, a few Midwestern states as well, that according to Atlantic reporter Derek Thompson. That's right. So is the Zoom revolution going to create lasting dispersal from big cities? Derek Thompson, he joins us now to discuss why he isn't particularly optimistic about the future of America's metropolitan areas, or at least in their current iteration. So Derek, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, man. So, Derek, tell us a little bit about kind of the thesis within this, because there was at the beginning of the pandemic, people were like, work from home will revolutionize everything. Then there was a backlash against that. You're somewhere in the middle. How exactly is this going to change America's demographics in the next decade? Yeah, my thesis, pretty simply stated, is is just that remote work is going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing. Uh, Historically, there's been this connection, this tether between work and home. Uh, People tend to live in the cities where they work. And all I'm saying here is that the fact that we have now lived, or at least the white collar workforce has now lived through 12 months where they've learned that they can essentially work from home productively. A lot of families, especially families with children, are going to make different kinds of decisions about where to live. They know they don't have to live 10 minutes away from work. They know that maybe they can live 30 minutes, 90 minutes away from work, become a super commuter. And you don't need to have, you know, 50% of the knowledge economy, the white collar workforce to do this for it to have an effect. Even if just 10% of the white collar workforce decides to move, you know, 60 minutes away from the central business district or move out of that state and live in Atlanta, but technically work in San Francisco or work for a company based in New York, this is going to have really significant impacts on the geography of the U.S. economy. And Derek, one of the things you point out that's really interesting is that obviously the technology has been available for quite a while. um, And there have been predictions before that just the availability of that technology was going to create some of the changes that you forecast here. But what you highlight is that what's really changed is a cultural shift where it's no longer a problem to have your meeting on Zoom or you're looked down upon for asking to have the meeting on Zoom and that that could ultimately be the thing that shifts the dynamics here. I think this is such an important point, and I don't think that it's a well understood point. Uh, The economist David Otter told me that the most important thing that this pandemic did isn't that it taught you how to Zoom or me currently how to Skype. It's that it taught everyone else around you how to Zoom and how to Skype. One of your producers knew that you could reach out to me and say, hey, Derek, do you want to shoot a little bit of TV on Skype? And I would immediately say, yes, of course, I can do that. I know how. So now we know how this works. We understand that everyone around us understands this technology works. And he compared it really interestingly, I thought, to another uh, piece of telecom technology, which is the telephone. The telephone was invented in the 1860s, Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, it was came, Telephone started to be sold in the 1870s, but it wasn't until the 1950s that more than half of Americans actually had a telephone in their house. Why? It's because they, you needed to get over the sort of coordination problem. A family wasn't going to buy a telephone if no one around them had a telephone. But suddenly, when telephone sort of penetration passed a certain level, say 40, 45 percent, suddenly the popularity of the telephone went crazy because everyone was like, oh, I can buy a telephone because everyone else around me has one. The same kind of coordination problems, the same uh, sort of, it's called Metcalfe's Law in, in, in sort of network theory, that the, the value of the communications network gets more valuable as more people join the network. We all leapfrogged over that coordination problem at the exact same time. So going forward, more of these in-person white collar meetings are going to be converted to essentially telecommunications meetings. Hmm. Something and you and I have talked about previously, Derek, was about how this is going to change America's electoral landscape. Because if I think about white collar workers who are in urban superstar cities, Los Angeles, New York, moving to Arizona and Georgia, I'm like, hmm, well, you just had these two states that just went blue for the first time in a long time, especially in Georgia because of Metro Atlanta. How is this going to change America's electoral map in the future? One thing that we've seen is that the pandemic has, this is a bit of a cliche, but it's true, accelerated pre-existing trends. So between 2010 and 2018, the eight metros that added the most domestic movers, that's people within the U.S. moving somewhere else in the U.S., were Dallas, Phoenix, Houston, Austin, Tampa, Atlanta, Charlotte, and San Antonio. All eight of those cities, all eight of those metros are in states that voted for Donald Trump in 2016. So what we're seeing 
is a migratory pattern in the US where a lot of people are leaving some of the larger cities on the coast and some of the larger states on the coast, which tend to be blue, and moving into states that are a light shade of red or even purple. So I do think it is defensible to say that on top of all the other demographic and political trends that might be nudging a state like Georgia from the light red columns to light blue column, you also have this migratory shift that has been accelerated by the pandemic that I think will be beneficial to Democrats in the long run. Yeah, and that has implications also for um, the sort of divides in our society. I mean, the current system, the way this works, is very expensive to be in these sort of top tier superstar cities. So you have the rich able to congregate there and it creates a class division and also creates a geographic division. So what are some of the implications on that front? Well, let me tell you where I'm hopeful. Uh, it's, it, it's hard to make a strong prediction here, but let me tell you why, why I'm hopeful. One of the big problems with the U.S. right now is that the richest, most productive, most dense cities aren't building enough housing so that middle and lower middle class people can move into those cities and benefit from those local economies. What would be better is if we somewhat spaced out the distribution of high income workers and high income companies throughout the US, it's possible that we're beginning to see that very trickle at the moment. So that the sort of portfolio of superstar cities that typically would only be, you know, five or six names long, New York City, Washington DC, San Francisco, Los Angeles, maybe it doubles or triples. It adds cities like Austin and Nashville and Miami and if we can broaden out this sort of pantheon of superstar cities, I do think that that means that there's more housing available, more work available for people to move in close to these high income companies and benefit from upward mobility. Yeah. And in fact, we already see rents really significantly dropping in some of those cities and what could be a sign of things to come. Derek, really fascinating article. Thank you so much. It's so great to have you. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Coming up, friend of the show, Ryan Grimm is going to discuss John Fetterman's run for Senate in Pennsylvania when rising returns.